morning and uh, welcome to FBC Afton's online time of worship this morning. My name is Josh Klink. I serve as the, the pastor here at FBC Afton. And uh, Sunday we refer to as the Lord's Day. And what we see in the Bible is on the Lord's Day, these local bodies would come together and they would participate in worship. They would participate in instruction and they would participate in fellowship. But you see, it wasn't limited to to just the Christians. No, all were welcome to join together in these gatherings. And so that's what we seek to do here at FBC Afton as well, to connect with God and with one another through worship of God and fellowship with one another on the Lord's Day. And what we also do is we seek to grow through the instruction of God's Word. And then the hope is that um, we can also have an opportunity to serve one another with the gifts that God has given us, and then be compelled to go into the world to multiply disciples. And just like with those early gatherings, it's not limited to just Christians. No, all are welcome to join. And so thank you. Thanks for taking some time this Sunday, setting aside this time on the Lord's Day to join together for this time of worship with us here at FBC Afton. And with it being Memorial Day weekend, we also want to take a moment to recognize and and celebrate what Memorial Day is about. And I think there's uh, an appropriate passage of scripture that I want to bring to mind in regard to this. In Philippians chapter 2, we see the Apostle Paul, he wrote this letter to the church in Philippi. And he talks about these two men, first Timothy, and he describes him as one with proven worth, as a, a son who is serving with his father, Paul, in the gospel. And then the second is Epaphroditus. He describes him as a brother and a fellow worker. He also calls him a fellow soldier, a messenger, and a minister to his needs. And then he gets to verses 29 and 30, and he says to receive these men in the Lord with all joy and to honor such men. And he goes on to describe, for he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in service to me. And when we think about Memorial Day, we are remembering, memorializing those who have, like these men, risked their life. In our context, they have uh, given their life for the, the liberties that we are blessed to enjoy here in America. Both men and women over the years of our country's history who have given their lives, the ultimate cost, the sacrifice to be able to, again, enjoy these these liberties, these freedoms we have. And so I want to take a a moment this morning and just have a moment of silence. And then after having a a moment of silence, I'm going to lead us in a word of prayer. And then we will begin worshiping God by joining our voices together as one voice, worshiping God in song. So if you would, bow your heads at home with me and observe this moment of silence in remembrance of those who have given their lives for our country. Gracious Heavenly Father, We are gathered together this morning for the purpose of worshiping you. But Lord, uh, our our culture sets aside uh, this day once a year, uh, and we really take this weekend to remember. Lord, and and when we think of sacrifice, uh, the ultimate sacrifice, the forerunner in terms of sacrifice is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, We looked at Philippians 2 uh, just moments ago where there are these two men mentioned who were uh, sacrificial servants for the word, risking their lives for the gospel. And in the first half of chapter 2, we see the Lord Jesus Christ who uh, gave up the the heavenlies. He uh, didn't use his uh, identity as God as something to, to, to take advantage of. Instead, he emptied himself. He took on the form of a servant. He took on flesh of a human being, born as a baby, living the life as a a human being, as a man, feeling pain and and hurt and and betrayal and suffering. 
And Lord, he gave the sacrifice all the way up to the cross. He was obedient to your will and dying. And not just any ordinary death, but no, he, he suffered a painful and a humiliating death on the cross. And so, Lord, we thank you first and foremost for his sacrifice. But as us who are uh, residents here in this nation in America, Lord, we recognize that there are many men and women throughout the, the history of our nation who have, again, given their lives, who have followed in the footsteps of Christ, sacrificing themselves for uh, a cause uh, that was uh, believed in strongly to uh, establish a nation of freedom and liberty, a nation that sought to uh, reflect the, the principles of your will, of your word, Lord. And so we honor these men and women this day. And God, I pray that uh, those who are gathered at their, their homes would uh, remember any family members, any relatives, would would recognize and, and thank those who, who are veterans who have served as well. Uh, but Lord, help us to, to never forget those who have uh, made this great sacrifice. And, and also, again, let us never forget the forerunner of sacrifices, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who again, we are gathered again together this morning from our separate locations, but gathering online to, to worship you in song, to grow through the instruction of your word, to still be able to fellowship with one another, even though it is online. Lord. God, help us in this time to, uh, to be intentional about fellowshipping with one another and help us to be faithful to Go into the world to multiply disciples as you have called us to do. And Lord, in this time, prepare our hearts and our minds to worship you, for you are worthy. You are so good and so great. God, we give you thanks for, for, for you, just for who you are. And it's in the precious name of Jesus Christ, our sacrifice, our Lord and our Savior, we pray. Amen. is not in what I own, not in the strength of flesh and bone, but in the costly wounds of love at the cross. My worth is not in skill or name, in win or lose, in pride or but in the blood of Christ that flowed at the cross. I rejoice in my Redeemer, greatest treasure, wellspring of my soul. I will trust in Him, no other. My soul is satisfied. In Him alone As summer flies we fade and 
I sought the Lord And he answered me And delivered me From every fear And those who look on him Are radiant And never be ashamed Never be ashamed. This poor man 
I've traveled back and forth to North Carolina many times now. And because of that, I can say that I know the route pretty well. I know where to expect traffic. I, w- I know where some of the, the nicer sites are. I know where to get off the highway to uh, maybe take a shortcut or to, to stop at a rest area or a gas station. Um, and I also know where those long, seemingly endless portions of highway are. And the first one that I always have to encounter is I-81 going down through Pennsylvania. And and a lot of it is is pretty mountainous. There's these ups and downs, some some pretty good curves. And, you know, there's actually some relatively steep edges if you were to go off the road on the highway there. Overall, though, I I wouldn't consider it a particularly dangerous portion of highway. And and I'm sure that many of you have driven that highway uh, and are familiar with it as well. Depending on the time of day, though, When driving through that portion of highway, certain times there may be this thick fog that rests over it. And even though, as I've said, I know that strip of highway, it becomes much more frightening when that fog rests over it. But because I know the road from driving it, driving on it in the past, I rely on that experience. But that is limited experience. And so as I am presently driving on the highway, I discover new things about the highway, maybe uh, even just different traffic that's on there at that time who's also trapped in that fog. But then at the same time, I also know of this better situation in the future. And I, and I hope for the realization of that future promise, the reality that this fog, it does not last forever. Eventually, if I just keep driving, even at a slow pace, I will be out of it. Or, or even worst case scenario, I would just pull off to a rest area or a gas station and wait for that fog to eventually lift. But you see that fog, it, it makes driving that portion of highway much more frightening than it really is. But I kind of presented three parts of knowledge. Past experiences, present discoveries, and future hope. And these three parts combine to, you know, remove the, the fear that that fog stirs inside me. And so I'm talking about fog in a literal sense, but I want you to to consider with me fogginess in a more abstract sense. Fogginess regarding spiritual truths in our world. See, this fogginess in spiritual truths, it makes the world much more frightening than it really is. But you see, knowledge of God acts as the sun breaking through on a foggy morning and dissipating that fear as as the fog clears away on that sunny morning. And knowledge of God, likewise, it includes three parts. Relying on your past experiences with God, discovering new mercies of God in the present, and then hoping on God's promises for the future. This morning, we are in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 through 23. In this passage of scripture, it teaches us about prayer. Specifically in it, we see prayer for knowledge, for wisdom, for understanding. And we learn that that we need the Spirit's help in this. This portion of Paul's letter I'm addressing to the prayers in Athens. Not the prayers, the prayers. And I tell you what, last week in verses 3 through 14 of Paul's worship, that's a tough act to follow. But in Ephesians 1, what we see is Paul, he follows his worship of God with prayer to God. And worship and prayer, these are fundamental for Christians. Our passage this morning, it's another run-on sentence in Greek. It's, it's a little shorter than last week. This one's only 169 words long. But Paul, he starts this morning with this thanksgiving for the, the faithful testimony of believers. But by the end, his thanksgiving, it transitions into this lofty praise of the exalted Christ. And so this morning, our passage is going to begin with this testimony of faith. In verses 15 and 16. And this testimony of faith that frames this two parts prayer for knowledge in verses 17 through 19. And then that just kind of naturally bleeds into this praise of the Christ who grows in verses 20 through 23. And so this morning, as we prepare to grow in God's word, I want to invite you to join me in a word of prayer at this moment. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we do just come before you.
uh, desperate, acknowledging our, our neediness for you. God, we thank you that we can worship you as we saw the Apostle Paul just overflow with worship last week. Lord, I pray that uh, as we talked about last week, our, our hoses would be tapped into the source of your word so that you just pour praise and worship out of us that you are deserving of. God, we need your Holy Spirit's help as we seek to grow in our knowledge of you uh, and grow into Christ likeness through the growth of our knowledge this morning. God, I specifically ask that you would just grow your spirit in me to speak through me, to make me less so that you would be made more. And God, as, as Paul even demonstrates in this prayer this morning, I thank you for uh, just the faithfulness of your church here in Athens, Lord, for the, uh, the, the prayers who are gathering, the, the givers who are continuing to find ways to, uh, to give to the church, for the, the servants who are uh, sacrificing their time or their resources to uh, love their neighbors through prayer or through uh, material needs, God. Your church uh, are the beautiful hands and feet of your gospel, and I thank you for that. God, in this time, we do pray, uh, again, specifically for your spirit to just grow in us so that we can hear from you what it is you want us to hear and to know so you can grow in us Christ-likeness that honors you and glorifies you. Help us, Lord Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. So let's go ahead and just jump right in looking at this letter to the prayers in Afton, beginning with the testimony of faith in verses 15 and 16. God's word says, For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. Now the language in this passage it is shared in a couple other of Paul's letters. Look at Colossians 1.4. He says, since we heard of your faith in Christ, excuse me, faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints. Also in Philemon 1.5, because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. So Paul, he is, he's hearing these reports. He's learning about the faithfulness of these Christians that he disciples. And that is an extremely rewarding report for him to receive. So he's thankful for their testimony. And so he begins writing this prayer of thanksgiving for them. And it's important to understand the timeline of when this letter was written was years after Paul had really planted this church in Ephesus. And the church had been experiencing considerable growth since that time. And the growth in and of itself, that's, that's a testimony of the faithful believers in Ephesus. And so Paul's saying he is thankful for these saints. And so he says that he is habitually thanking God for them whenever he prays. Their faithfulness, it's really, it's essential to what it means to be a Christian. But what else is an essential mark of Christians uh, that Paul also highlights in Ephesians 1 and Colossians and Philemon? It is love. See, these Three verses, these three passages that we're looking at are really an embodiment of the greatest commandment. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And then to love your neighbor as yourself. See, Paul, he's expressing this gratitude for the love toward all the saints that they display. And so this means that at the time of this letter, the church in Ephesus, they had this reputation of just great love for one another. And see, as a Christian you could simply summarize a Christian this way. A person who has faith in Christ and love toward his saints. See, the people of God are to love one another. Jesus said this is how people are going to know that we are his disciples. I love uh, the band for King and Country. Their simple song just says, let my life be the proof of your love. And so to the prayers in Afton, in your prayers, give thanks to God for his saints as this act of love toward them. Again, Paul, he had this habit of expressing thankfulness for the saints. I mean, even to the Corinthian church and, and the background of the church in Corinth tells us that this was a church full of rabble rousers. Yeah, you can use that word if you want. But Paul is showing that by God's grace, we can find reasons for thanks for all believers. See, the truth is, it's much easier to be critical of one another. It takes some hard work of spiritual maturity to actually recognize grace 
and others. And so Paul, he is modeling this habit of recognizing grace in one another. here. And so let's follow his example. Let's thank God in our prayers for the evidences of grace that we see in God's people. But then not only that, Paul, he writes this letter to the church. He's expressing this thankfulness. He is sharing with them that, that he thanks God for them. And so after you are thanking God in your prayers for your brothers and sisters, share it with them. Go ahead, call them up, tell them, send them a, a Zoom invite, whatever you got to do. I guarantee you that they will feel loved by you. And in turn, you will feel loved as well. So model this prayer of thanksgiving. And after beginning this prayer uh, with thanksgiving in verses uh, 15 through 23 this morning, Paul begins to just transition into petitioning for these saints in his prayer. And so in verses 17 through 19, we see a prayer for knowledge. Paul continues, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his great might. So the beginning of uh, verses 17 and verses 18 are actually the, the two parts of Paul's prayer that he introduced at the end of verse 16. So it'd be helpful to think of it with each verse starting with the words, I pray. And if you're looking on the screen now, you notice I put that in brackets. So starting in verse 17, it was, it's better understood as I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ may give you a spirit, excuse me, of wisdom and revelation. And then verse 18, I pray that you may know. And so again, I'm addressing this letter to the prayers in Athens. And we see Paul, he is a prayer in this passage. And prayer, it's, it's instrumental to the Christian life. And yet, again, I haven't done formal research on this, but in my experience, the more Christians I talk to about their prayer life, most seem to express a sense of dissatisfaction with their prayer life. And perhaps you can relate to that feeling like you, you wish there was more or, or you engaged in it better or you participated more frequently. And so with that in mind, I want us to piece together in our time this morning a, a biblical overview of prayer because it is so prominent in our passage this morning. So let's start with a simple definition of prayer. The practice of communicating with God. Hopefully that starts to just peel back some of the stressors of what prayer is supposed to be. But in our passage this morning, we see Paul include uh, certain aspects of prayer. Again, we talked about thanksgiving and giving thanks for the saints in Ephesus. And then we started just now looking at his intercession. That is a request on behalf of others. You intercede for others. And then the end of our passage this morning will end with uh, a praise from Paul. But in other parts of the Bible, we also see prayers include petitions. That's requests on behalf of oneself. Even Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, he gave a petition to God asking to let this cup pass from him. We see confession in prayers. I think of Psalm 51, David confessed his sin for, with Bathsheba. We actually see songs also introduced as prayers. I have the example listed on the screen, the song of Ham Hannah, is introduced as a prayer of Hannah in 1 Samuel 2. And then also we see laments included in prayers. There's an entire book actually dedicated to that. But the beautiful reality is the Bible teaches us that God listens to our prayers. He's not distant. He's not far off this, this, this strange deity that, that we just offer up prayers and hope that he is going to respond. No, we don't strong arm God into getting his attention. He, he hears the Bible tells us. He listens to our prayers. And so prayers in the Bible with God, they represent this, this conversational intimacy that is just precious. But then at the same time, we also see more structured 
or, or liturgical, also kind of this idea of ceremonial prayers. Liturgy it literally means the form used for public worship. And so the, the Bible, we actually kind of see this development of prayer as, as you go through the pages of the scriptures. In the Old Testament, the, the earliest prayers, they were primarily these spontaneous and unfiltered communications with God. I have an example listed on the bottom of the screen here. Numbers chapter 12, verse 13, Moses cries out to the Lord, Oh God, please heal her, please. See, it's very spontaneous, very unfiltered. And for time's sake, I have many others listed on the screen there, all these references, but I'm not going to go and, and read through all of them. But you see, it did not take long for these prayers to go from spontaneous and unfiltered to become more standardized and liturgical. And, and they actually increased in length as well. A few examples of those would be 1 Kings chapter 8, Ezra chapter 9, verses 6 through 15, and Nehemiah chapter 9. And again, for time's sake, I'm not going to go and read through all of those, but you see them listed on the screen there. I encourage you, jot them down. Look them up later today or even sometime this week. I mean, they're still powerful and beautiful prayers. They're just more standardized, more liturgical. And then there's what's come to be known as the Shema in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9. And it reads, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. And so this prayer, this, this Shema, this passage here, it became a liturgical prayer. It was used in worship of God corporately, but then it was also adopted by many Israelites, many of God's people, and, and they would pray this privately. One example is that many believe that this was at least part of what Daniel would pray when we are presented to his prayers in Daniel chapter 6, verse 10. Remember when that edict was signed, Daniel knew the document had been signed. He went to his house where he had his windows in his upper chamber open toward Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and he prayed and he gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. And so liturgy, it, it grew with the establishment of the, the office of priesthood. These priests, they would actually serve as the intercessor between mankind and God, and they would do so through prayers. And then they would serve in the temple, which became known as a house of prayer. And we see Jesus called that in Matthew 21, verse 13. It is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. But because the temple wasn't always conveniently located as Jews began spreading further and further away, eventually synagogues began to pop up. And they would serve as a surrogate location for these prayers to take place. And so you'd have attendants at the synagogue who would lead in these prayers of thanksgiving, psalms, and, and they would both read and also write blessings uh, that were used as standardized prayers. In fact, some of these standardized prayers that were written at synagogues were discovered when the Dead Sea Scrolls were on earth. But these prayers uh, are, are believed to actually have been crafted as an instrument to both lead and instruct the community in this prayer activity. And that would then in turn lead to, to this individual and, and personal heartfelt prayers as the, the community would actually disperse from that communal worship. And I think that's great for us to be able to adopt something like that. You see on the screen here, for all of us to be able to allow public prayers to actually lead and instruct our personal and our heartfelt prayers as we disperse from communal worship. But you see, with all of this in mind, in the ancient world, prayer for Christianity, it was distinct in comparison to the way other religions participated in prayer. Because again, God, he interacted with his people. He interacts still today, I should say, with his people who pray. Leslie Harden, she comments on this so well. She says, 
God appears in the garden speaking to his creation. Adam, where are you? The first recorded prayer in Genesis, it's this two-way argument between Abraham and God about Abraham's childlessness. And then Yahweh answers David's cry of lament. Why do the nations rage with the words, you are my son. Today, I have become your father. But as prayers began creeping more toward this standardized nature, that which made Christianity distinct in terms of prayer seemed to start to become no different from other religions. Prayer was morphing into this fixed mechanical task. And so what happens was in the New Testament, Jesus emphasized the, the need to return to this honest and genuine prayer. And so he teaches about this early on in his ministry, in Matthew chapter 6, with what we understand as the Lord's Prayer. And I would actually contend that I believe this is an area where the church historically has erred. Because Jesus, in Matthew chapter 6, he was not teaching, telling the church to institute the Lord's Prayer as a new standardized prayer. No, he begins his teaching by saying, at the beginning of Matthew 6, do not pray like the hypocrites. Do not pray like the Gentiles. And he describes them as praying on street corners and in synagogues. And he says they would heap up empty phrases. Now, an empty phrase, it's simply a word that would be spoken, but not meant. So with that in mind, I have to ask, how many standardized prayers have Christians spoken that were simply an empty phrase being heaped up? Specifically, how many times has the Lord's Prayer been this standardized prayer as a part of a church service, and the believers were heaping up empty phrases by speaking it? as a participation. I know I've done this because we, we just, we haven't memorized, right? And so we're just sitting there and it's maybe at the end of service, we're just our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And Jesus is saying, don't do that. Do not be like the hypocrites. Do not be like the Gentiles. Don't just heap up these empty phrases in public settings for others to hear. Before he says the Lord's prayer, Jesus says, pray like this. He does not say to recite this prayer. See, what he's doing is he's modeling a prayer that goes through key and important theological themes. The prayer starts, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And so what is happening here is this is a prayer that is just recognizing the sanctity of God's name. The prayer continues, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so this is an expression in prayer of the desire for the manifestation of God's glory throughout the earth. The prayer continues, give us this day our daily bread. This is a prayer that is asking a request for the adequate provisions that we have in our world this day. Prayer continues, and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And Jesus, he didn't have to pray this. He didn't have any trespasses. He didn't have any sin. But again, he's modeling for us to pray a petition for oneself for the forgiveness of sins. And then lastly, we see him say, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. This is a prayer of hope, hope of God's deliverance from sin and Satan and, and the wickedness in this world. So again, I, I say, don't just recite this prayer. Don't heap this up as an empty phrase, but pray like this. Pray these same types of theological themes in your prayers. And when we talk about theological themes, where do we get those from? Well, we, we do learn them from Scripture. So I'm not saying it's wrong to pray the Lord's Prayer. Don't heap it up as an empty phrase. Because you see, praying Scripture is essentially what, what Christ is modeling. In praying scripture, it, it will sanctify us. It will make us holy. It will transform us to become more like Christ. And so I would encourage you, pray, pray with your Bible open. Pray, open it up right in front of you. Use it as a, as a guide. And, and for example, praying with, with what Paul is praying, our passage this morning, pray that as a prayer. You take your Bible, set it in front of you during your time of prayer. 
and have the passage right here and, and just pray it. You don't have to read it verbatim, but, but re, re state it back in your prayers like, like this, for example, father, I thank you for the faithfulness in, in Christ and the love of your saints in Africa. God, I pray that, that you would give us wisdom and revelation and knowledge of you through your Holy Spirit, that you would enlighten the eyes of our hearts so that we may know the hope to which you have called us to, the riches of the glorious inheritance you have blessed us with, and the immeasurable greatness of your power toward us who believe, according to the working of your mightiness, that you worked in Christ, raising him from the dead, seating him at your right hand above all governments and authorities and pandemics and above every name that is named for all eternity. Christ is victorious over every enemy. He is our head. We are his body. So fill us, Lord Jesus, for the furtherance of your magnificent name. And it is in that magnificent name, the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. See, this is how we pray scripture. And Jesus, he also prayed scripture. Multiple times on the cross, he cried out psalms to the Father as prayers. And so let me put it this way simply. God's words make great words. I would even say the best words for our prayers. But outside of the Lord's prayer, all of Jesus' prayers, they were real. He wasn't just merely demonstrating prayer for us, although he was modeling but they were real. They were genuine. They were intense prayers, perhaps as any prayer has ever been spoken. And I love this because nothing brings out the the true human nature of Jesus Christ more than his clear dependence on the Father in prayer. And so from Jesus's time, God's followers begin to move away from those standardized prayers. And really what we see is John 16, 24 is the turning point in the history of prayer. Jesus was saying, until now, you have asked nothing in my name. And he says, ask, and you will receive that your joy may be full. See, Jesus was not redirecting prayer from the Father to the Son. No, he's saying the Son is giving us new access to the Father. Jesus says, pray, excuse me, pray to the Father. Just tell him that the Son sent you. And so this emphasis of praying to God as our Father, it was absent in the Old Testament. Yeah, I mean, the Old Testament teaches that God is described as our Father, but he was not addressed as Father in prayers. And so praying to God as Father, it communicates a level of intimacy that was absent from those standardized prayers. And it's also echoing what Paul taught back in verse 5 on us being predestined for adoption. And so now... We've come a long way from that simple definition of communicating with God. And if you're starting to feel like, wow, prayer is overwhelming. And, and, and Josh, honestly, I, I don't know what I'm supposed to pray. And if you're feeling that, if you're thinking that, fear not, because you're not alone. Again, looking to God's word, none of us know what to pray at one time or another. And so when we don't know what to pray, Romans 8.26 teaches that the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what to pray or as we ought. And keep in mind, this is the Apostle Paul who who knows an awful lot about God and his word. And he is saying we, he's including himself in that. So we do not know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And so Jesus, he is emphasizing this return to, to intimacy with God in our prayers. And keep in mind, again, the early church They did not completely remove all liturgical prayers. They would practice this mixture of spontaneous and liturgical. But here's what the emphasis became. In all prayers, both liturgical, both spontaneous, it's authenticity and sincerity. We see that in Hebrews 10.22. And one of these early church fathers, Origen, he gave counsel that the good prayer consisted of these four components. First, ascription of glory to God through Christ. Second would be common thanksgivings. Third is a recitation of personal sin, confession. And then fourth is the asking for the great and heavenly things, both personal and general. 
And so prayers, I would summarize it this way. They're to be offered with reverence, which is this, this godly fear. They're to be offered with humility, this, this humble understanding of, of our insignificance and our unworthiness in contrast to, to God's majesty and magnificence. Prayer, it is, it is to be earnest, offered with this unhesitating submission to whatever God's will is. And ultimately, prayers are to be offered in faith. Because you see, prayer, it's, it's an act of worship. It is one soul approaching the Lord of the universe in his throne. So it comes from this, this understood need that we have, but also confidence that, that God is going to reward those who diligently seek him. And so prayers, we address them to God again, our Heavenly Father, who in his great love predetermined to adopt us before the foundation of the earth. And they are given in the name of Jesus Christ, our mediator, our advocate, who is seated at the right hand of the Father. And they are actually formulated and developed through this enabling work of the indwelling Holy Spirit in us. And so I summarize this normal idea. You see it on your screen in this way. To pray in the Spirit, through the Son, to the Father. And Paul, he is talking deeply about prayer here, but his desire and what he is praying for is for his disciples to grow. And so the kind of prayer that Paul focuses on in our passage this morning are prayers for knowledge. Excuse me. So Paul's message is this. Pray to know God so that you can grow in God. And you have Psalm 119 on the screen. There are multiple examples of prayers for knowledge in this lengthy psalm. There's, I believe, 11 total, if I remember correctly. I just pulled three as examples. Verse 18, open my eyes so that I may contemplate wonderful things from your instruction. Verse 34, help me to understand your instruction. Verse 135, show favor to your servant and teach me your statutes. So Paul's first prayer for knowledge in our passage this morning is in verse 17. And it's a request for believers to receive a spirit of wisdom and of revelation. And this phrase is actually an allusion to the description of the spirit. In Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2, it says, The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. So we know Paul is referencing the Holy Spirit in our passage. And then we see also in Paul's letter to the church in Corinth, 1 Corinthians 2, that the Spirit reveals the things of God to us. Look in verse 10 on your screen. He wrote, These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. And so this is communicating the Spirit's role in what we refer to in in Christian circles as illumination. It's the idea that God is opening our eyes to know both Him and His truth. And so illumination, this essentially it's the means through which we understand God's Word. And we see we need the Spirit for this. In 1 Corinthians 2, Paul presents this natural person. And he says that the natural person does not have the spirit, but they're familiar with Christian ideals, Christian teachings, but they lack understanding and it ultimately renders them blind. You can see the truth is that it is only the Holy Spirit that brings enlightenment to, as verse 18 in our passage says, the eyes of our hearts. This makes us utterly dependent upon the Spirit. Later, Paul talks about this heart, how it's darkened by sin later in the book of Ephesians. And so John Owen, he gives a good summary of the heart based off of Scripture's conversation. He says, the heart in Scripture, it's variously used, sometimes for the mind and understanding, sometimes for the will, sometimes for the affections, sometimes for the conscience, sometimes for the whole soul. Generally, and this is the case here, it denotes the whole soul of man and all the faculties of it. Not absolutely, but as they are all one principle of moral operations, as they all concur in in our doing of good and evil. And so in verse 18, this idea of illumination, it's, it's the idea of enlightening the heart that Paul talks about. 
And so it's not that it's a new revelation. No, it's, it's, it's more so grasping and, and affirming this revelation that is being given in God's word, either as you read it, as it's being preached at you, or as it is being taught to you. But meanwhile, we got to keep in mind, spiritual warfare is going on. So sin, it is active. It is seeking to block us from, from this understanding. And it leads to our failure to, to seek the Spirit's illumination because we'll inflate our view of self. And so becoming a student of, wor- of the Word, it begins with this heart of humility, understanding our need for the Holy Spirit, for God's help in this, and really asking God to, to give us understanding, just as the psalmist prayed in Psalm 119. And so the Spirit, he will, he will tune us in. He'll, he'll open our mind, our, our heart's eye, as again Paul says. And so R.C. Sproul, he, he defines illumination this way. It's the application of God's revealed truth to our hearts so that we grasp the reality for ourselves, what this sacred text says. And Protestants, we have come to understand illumination as occurring in two stages. First, there is this external illumination. It's where we encounter God's word. And then second is the internal illumination. This is the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And there's kind of two parts. There's first leading to salvation. And there's second, it's this continual progressing sanctification, making us more holy, more like Christ. And the Holy Spirit does this by first communicating through God's law and helping us understand our sin. We are confronted with the reality of what God's law teaches and how we are living, thinking, acting, believing, behaving, worshiping. But then secondly, he communicates the gospel of God's grace and forgiveness. It conveys this call to salvation. And so that is why we, as the hands and feet of the gospel, are to simply preach the word. We bring the word. We present people with the word and trust the spirit to do the same. I love what Spurgeon, C.H. Spurgeon, he once preached that, Without the Spirit, it would be easier to teach a tiger to become a vegetarian than it would to teach an unsaved person the gospel. And so then upon one's salvation, the work of the Spirit, it does not cease, right? Again, we see he continues to grow our our understanding, our, our, our heart, our knowledge of God throughout our whole life as a Christian. He will prompt this continual repentance in us as we are confronted with sin in our life in contrast to a just and holy God. But then he also balances that with the assurance of God's never-ending, limitless, continual saving grace. And so this illumination, it will continue through the ministry of God's word. And so what Paul is demonstrating in our passage this morning is the role of prayer in this ministry. Because he prays that the saints would have knowledge. We see it twice. First in verse 17, I have it underlined, where he says, in the knowledge of And then second, in verse 18, he says that you may know. Paul wants believers to have knowledge. But what is this knowledge that Paul is praying for exactly? It communicates a a personal recognition, familiarity. It's also, again, it's still at the same time coming to understand something clearly and distinctly as both true and valid. I remember earlier I talked about that strip of highway that I traveled through multiple times and repeatedly I said how I know that highway. And again, I'm not talking just about that informational knowledge, although I do know that. It's Interstate 81. Most of it has two lanes. There's some parts that has three lanes as you're going up hills allowing you to pass people. I know that that part of the highway is through the state of Pennsylvania. So I know all that information about it. But when I say I know that highway, I'm saying I know it in an experiential way. I've driven it many a time, so I know that highway. And earlier I said that knowing it carries the sense I'm relying uh, on what has been experienced in the past and also new discoveries in the present, but then also hoping in promises for the future. And so this same type of knowledge that I'm trying to, to, to communicate is talked about in Jeremiah 9.24 in relation to the Lord. Let him who boasts, boast in this, that he understands and knows me. 
that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. And we also see in the Bible, in contrast, these warnings against what is falsely called knowledge. Paul writes that to Timothy. This false knowledge, it's, it's like the fog on the highway. It clouds our path in this world. It swerves people away from faith in God. And so when scripture speaks of this knowing God, like we see in Jeremiah 9, yes, there's that intellectual component to it. There's the, the understanding, the, the knowing truths about God. But he adds to that as well. There's more to it because knowing God, it includes this, this volitional and moral component. It's trusting and obeying and worshiping God, but practicing things like he says here, steadfast love, justice, and righteousness. And so the Bible, all of these things it teaches are part of knowing God. Another example comes in 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God. Because God is love. So the Bible, again, it's teaching us that, that we can know God in this way. And the reason we can is because it also teaches that God first knows us. A few passages to, to list here as an example. John chapter 10, 14, uh, Galatians 4, 9. And I just now see that I didn't change that reference. This is uh, supposed to be 2 Timothy 2, 19 on the bottom there, not 1 John 4. But John 10, 14, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own first and my own know me. Second. Galatians 4, 9 says, but now that you have come to know God, or rather, this is superseding that first part, to be known by God, how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world whose slaves you want to be once more? And then again, not 1 John 4, 7 and 8, 2 Timothy 2, 19. But God's firm foundation stands bearing this seal. The Lord knows those who are his. And let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. And so because God knows us, he is inviting us to in turn know him. And that's what Paul is praying for in our passage this morning. He is specifically praying that this knowledge would be this intimate family type knowledge. It's, again, it's a kind of knowledge that fathers and sons, brothers and sisters, mothers and daughters, that, that, that a family member would possess with one another. And so Paul, he expresses three truths about salvation that he wants the saints to have knowledge of. And we see them in verses 18 and 19. The first one is the hope to which he has called you. Again, notice you're not the one who picked up the phone and dialed God, right? No, God has called you. And, and, and what has God called you to specifically? Well, chiefly the, the community of Jesus, right? He has called you to this body. So if you're a believer, he has called you to be a member of the body of Christ. He has called you into the church. And how has he done that? Again, through someone else being the beautiful hands and feet that brought you the gospel. So therefore, anyone in the community of Jesus is called to be the beautiful hands and feet that bring the gospel to others. In the gospel, it extends hope. Presently, church, we are a community of hope. We share in God's glory. We, we share in the resurrection of Christ. We, we share in eternal life. This produces this rich hope in us. So as the church, when we do extend that gospel, we are literally inviting others into hope. And in this world of great suffering and, and tragedy and, and unethical practices and and, and dangers and, and uncertainty, hope becomes a, a cherished gift, valuable, precious. And so that's the first one. And that leads right into the second one, the riches of his glorious inheritance. Remember back in verse 14, we saw last week, he talked about that inheritance. And in that verse, he says, until we acquire possession of it. That was in reference to the fullness of time. So this glorious inheritance, it's talking about the heavenly rewards that we will acquire in his presence at the fullness of time. And then third in verse 19, the immeasurable greatness of his power. 
And this is almost a, a, a climax in Paul's prayer. Paul, he, is, he actually expands on this in verses 20 through 23, this power demonstrating how immeasurable it truly is. But look at the end of verse 19 here specifically. Where is this power directed? It says, toward us who believe. This power, it is available to the saints. And, and it's true, church, that it is only by wielding this power are we able to have victory in the battle against sin, Satan, and death. Only by God's power are we raised and brought into his kingdom. And so in these verses, Paul is praying, that Christians would know God better. And the reality is this is the greatest need that all of us have. We all need to know God better. Later in Ephesians 4, Paul equates maturity to our growth in the knowledge of the Son of God. And so the reality is the Christian life, it starts, it continues through the middle, and it ends with knowing God. At the start, Jesus prayed and John 17, that eternal life is this, that we would know God. Paul demonstrates in, in the middle of his Christian life, when he wrote in Philippians 3, that his goal is to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. And he wrote that while preaching, or excuse me, while being in prison or preaching Christ. So he already knew Christ, but his goal was to know Christ still. That's the middle of the Christian life. And then John says in 1 John 3, of the end, that we would know Christ when he appears, because we will be like him, because we will see him as he is. And that's the end of the Christian life. And so the Christian life, it's moving towards seeing Christ unfiltered in this way. It's about knowing God. It's about making him known to others. You can see Spurgeon once said that what he knew of God was very little compared to the matchlessness of God's grace. And again, he, he knew a lot about God. And that's a, an appropriate sentiment for us all. No matter how much we know, it is so insignificant in comparison to the infinite nature of God and his glory and his goodness. And so Paul is teaching here that we are to pray that we would know God. And then God, who, who responds to prayers, will illuminate his word through the Holy Spirit so that we can grow in God. And this petition in verses 17 through 19 just naturally blends Paul's prayer right into a praise of the Christ who grows in verses 20 through 23. God's word continues that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. <clears throat> so real quick again, think back to that background that we know about the city of Ephesus. We looked at a couple weeks ago. All the, the, the spiritual forces of darkness, the, the dark arts, the emperor worship, the cults that were all present in this city created this culture of fear and hostility for its residents up until God renders all of those dark forces feeble with this great power we see in these verses. And so Paul, he's praising God, specifically the Christ who grows his saints. The reality is the enemy, he hates us. He hates God's people. He hates our faith. He hates the church, Christ's body. He hates our, our marriages, our relationships, our fellowship. He hates our mission. He hates it all. He's going to stand in opposition to it. And it makes it imperative for us to press into this Christ who grows, praying to, to know this immeasurable greatness of God's power. And in this passage, what example does Paul point to first as the power of God? It is the resurrection of Christ. And so, believer, this power, it is your power to share the gospel, to overcome sin, to pursue righteousness, to fight against the devil in his schemes, to be faithful to this mission, this power is your power. And what we're seeing here is this risen Christ. He's been exalted to the right hand of the Father. He's reigning from this eternal throne. And so again, the same power, it is now at work, it says, in God's people. 
And verse 21 shows his status above everything. Christ is supreme over all creation. He is supreme over Satan, over his schemes, over every man, ruler, government, virus, every earthly power. All of it is subject to Christ. And so what we see then in verses 22 and 23 is that he is the head of the church. And we see this teaching resurface again in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 15 and 16, when Paul writes, Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. When each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. This teaching, it is foundational, biblical teaching on church membership. And I do plan on going into greater detail about this later in our study in Ephesians. But the focus of our passage this morning is prayer for growth. And our passage this morning, paired with what we just looked at in chapter 4, it teaches us that growth occurs only in the context of biblical church membership. See, the church only exists and functions and grows by reason of its vital relationship to our head, and that is Jesus Christ. And he fills us with his spirit and with spiritual gifts. He makes the body and the head, the church and Christ, one. This is the reason that Paul repeatedly uses this phrase, in Christ, throughout Ephesians. And it also means that we are entirely dependent on Christ, our head, just as we are dependent on the spirit and illumination. I mean, think about it this way, this imagery. How well would your body grow if you were to detach the head? Not very well. In fact, the opposite would occur. And so Paul, he is praying for growth. And he concludes this with praising the Christ who grows. Again, he presents the Christ risen, exalted at the right hand of the Father communicating this authority over everything. And he says, really, for the sake of the church, meaning that Christ, who's been exalted to the highest place in the universe, he is our representative. He is governing the universe for our sake. He is growing those who are members attached as joints to his body. And Paul is praying that we would comprehend this amazing power of God that he is leveraging for our advantage. So I want to wind down with this reminder this morning. Paul, he began this this passage with, with a prayer of thanksgiving. And so he followed that by praying that, that these saints that he was thankful for would pray that they would know God in order to grow in God. And so this leads the same for us. So we must be praying that one another would know God so that one another would grow in God. But then also, you must pray for yourself individually. Pray that you would know God, so that you also can grow in God. Would you please join me in prayer at this moment? Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your spirit revealing your word to us, enlightening our heart's eyes. God, thank you for your saints. Specifically, I thank you for the prayers in Afton. I know that I have been blessed by many prayers, and I give you thanks for your church here in Afton, your hands, your feet, your body. Lord, I pray that we would all know you through your word so that we can grow in you, so that we can become like Christ, so that the body would work together to grow in unity and love and faithfulness. And God, I pray that uh, we would just continue to worship you in this time. We would continue to worship you as we go into the world. We are so utterly dependent upon you, Lord. Help us to never, never be confused by thinking that we are able to take on the enemy on our own strength. Our dependence upon you is, is so so magnificent, so great, so utterly clear. Help us to understand our continual need to grow in you and to just lean in you, to wield your power over the enemies of this world. God, you are mighty and great. We thank you that Christ is now risen and exalted, governing the universe for our sake and for your glory. God, you are good. 
We love you and thank you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. But you don't answer all my questions, but you hear me when I speak. You don't keep my heart from breaking. When it does, you weep with me You're so close that I can feel you When I've lost the words to pray And though my eyes have never seen you I've seen enough to say I know that you are good I know that you are kind I know that you are so much more than what I leave behind. I know that I am loved. I know that I am safe. Cause even in the fire to live is Christ, to die is gain. I know that you I don't understand the sorrow, but you're calm within the storm. Sometimes this weight is overwhelming, but I don't carry it alone. You're still close when I can't feel you, I don't have to be afraid. And though my have never seen you I've seen enough to say I know that you are good
amen. We want to be praying that we would know the things that, that we just sang about knowing so that we would not heap up empty phrases. Uh, some beautiful truths there. And, and, and again, we want to pray that we would know in that intimate type of way so that we can grow. As we prepare to uh, dismiss from this time of worship together, uh, you see a verse on your screen there, Colossians 1, verses 9 and 10. I want to encourage you from home, read along with me as I uh, read this passage for us. God's word says, And so, from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Amen.